So welcome in this morning session. It is early for me too. Uh, so what we're gonna do today, we will do a little bit of programming. So please, uh, please join the mentee. I will, there are, there are no really quizzes. There are just some questions. So, um, and some, you know, perceptions. So please join in. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can ask during the, the session. And I would like this session to be a little bit more coding. So you will be doing a little bit of coding. So take some time now, open your terminal. Um, you know, you may need to get off the bed <laughs> because you will be typing. <clears throat> so open a terminal and st start up a new project. Uh, call it whatever you want, but I call it Hello Chuck. So stack new Hello Chuck. Uh, and what um, I want you to do is I want you to modify the package YAML file by adding those two dependencies. So if I were to do it myself, I actually started. So I said stack new jokes. I called it jokes. And inside, if I go to jokes, I my package YAML. My package YAML has those two extra dependencies, right? So line 24, 25, uh, add those two dependencies inside your package YAML. And then if you have did if you if you've done stack new project, go in that project, modify the package YAML, and you add those two dependencies, you go stack build. Uh, why? Because it takes a while. On my laptop, I think it took about 10 minutes. So uh, you need to download and you need to kind of pre-compile a lot of dependencies because of those two dependencies. So it will take a while. So while it is doing it, I will be talking and we will be having some slides, but your laptop will sort of prepare you for being uh, able to compile and to do some more work. So uh, Aeson is a father of Jason uh, and the Greek mythology, and it's a dependency in Haskell for Jason parsing. So um, unlike Golang, um, Haskell is, Kind of in the middle between supporting everything in the in the core system libraries and using the dep external dependencies. So a lot of uh, code is in sort of a base and in the standard um, standard packages, st standard modules for the um, uh, language. But some of them are kind of done as add-ons. Um, so a Aeson is a, a standard JSON module for parsing and producing JSON. Uh, and it is kind of a separate uh, dependency. And then HTTP conduit is a high level API for doing uh, HTTP requests. So they are very useful for interacting with web services and websites. And uh, that's what you're doing in the cloud course. Uh, you're parsing some JSON and you're making some get and post requests. So those two libraries are kind of what we will cover today a little bit and you need to have them as dependencies. <clears throat> Golang has a lot of uh, libraries and a lot of support for uh, web programming and other forms of programming built in. You don't need to actually use external dependencies because they are part of the standard library, standard library stack. Um, but in Haskell, we often need to use dependencies for useful things and those two are very, very nice, very useful. So do this. Um, Rust, for example, is very minimalistic. So it's on the other spectrum. It's completely opposite to Golang. So in Rust, the core of the language is very minimal. And then almost all the functionality that is useful, you need to use from crates. You need to use from uh, external dependencies. All right, so you can ask me questions here, although I... I have this kind of thing here, which hides me the, the icon, maybe like this. Okay, and then uh, I will answer it. You can ask questions in the Zoom chat, of course. So the first, a little quiz. 
If you were to program a web application, now you know a little bit of Haskell, I hope, you know some of those languages. So what would be the best programming language for programming a web application? What would you choose? What would you do? What do you think is the best programming language for programming web applications? Uh, question, yeah, JavaScript, Miguel, perfect. So JavaScript is not here. <laughs> uh i i am very opinionated and i don't think scripting languages are programming languages yes you can code scripts in them but i am this is my rant uh so languages like python or javascript or php they are not programming languages they are just scripting languages they are useful for very small scripts uh and they are not really designed to deal with large complex problems and systems. Uh, of course, you can disagree with me. There are examples of very big pro programs written in Python and very big programs written in JavaScript. Um, and you can say, you know, look, uh, you know, Visual Studio Code is written in JavaScript. It's a prep, you know, perfectly big, complex, you know, IDE for programming and it's JavaScript. So why don't you say it's a programming language? And I would say, yes, you can write really big scripts in scripting languages. It doesn't change them to be programming languages. Um, so we can argue about that. We can have some uh, language wars. Those are the programming languages I consider being a programming languages. Um, JavaScript is not one of them. Uh, JavaScript is a language that we have to use for programming web, of course. We have to use JavaScript for interactivity inside the browser. And uh, with the um, Node, uh, you can do backend programming with JavaScript. Of course, I've done. I, I was programming JavaScript for backend uh, for a couple of years. And to be honest, I really enjoyed it. And I had arguments with my colleagues uh, who said, no, you should be doing backend in proper programming language, not in JavaScript. Um, so yes, it's a matter of opinion a little bit, but there are some properties which make those languages different to JavaScript uh, and what makes JavaScript different to those languages, right? And those properties make it easier to program in those languages rather than JavaScript. So for example, when we have um, Golang backend for a web, web application, uh, we talk about uh, error checking and tests and the tests are I don't know maybe 20 percent 30 percent of your code base depends how heavy you you're testing uh, but you know it's, it's normal to to be in the sort of range like that right whereas when I had my backend written in JavaScript the code base for testing was like 200 300 percent of the code base, which was actually doing the business logic. We had tests in hundreds uh, because of the lack of type safety. You have to test if you didn't make any typos or if you didn't do some stupid things in the code and any change you're introducing to the code needs to run through all those checks because there is no compiler to help you. Whereas with programming languages like those, the compiler is your friend. The compiler tells you if you're doing stupid mistakes, if you're having typos, or if you if your types don't match, or if you're doing some you know uh, some strange assignments of things like this, that's not the case in JavaScript. In JavaScript, you know almost everything goes, uh, almost everything can be coerced to another type, and you have to test heavily to make sure your code base is correct. So there are some differences. Um, yeah, TypeScript is uh, is a, is help, uh, and TypeScript will help you with some of that. Uh, so there is, yes, of course, like uh, there is no um, um, you, you you as I'm saying, you can do big bigger things in in the in the scripting languages, and TypeScript is pushing JavaScript towards this sort of uh, more type checks and uh, type safety. So. Of course, but the origin of the language and the nature of the language is still what it is, which is kind of a scripting. 
Yeah, anyway, so let, let's let's review that. So not many of you think you can do web programming with Rust. And I kind of agree, although I believe because of web assembly and because of the way Rust is very uh, small and uh, modular and you can do very uh, compact uh, representations and there are some web assembly compilers for Rust already. I'm kind of actually hoping Rust will become a better choice for doing um, web programming, both on the backend side and through web assembly on the front end side. So I kind of think, although I, I think Rust is still better than C, right? So I would still think uh, C should be the, the, uh, the lowest. So yeah, it depends on the opinion a little bit. C++, similar to C, not huge advantages. There are some uh, web servers and some uh, web frameworks written in C++, but it, it is kind of heavy to do anything web-wise in C++. Although, again, I think Rust should be probably between C++ and Java. Uh, Java, yes, you can do. They have um, a lot of support for um, rendering uh, front-end HTML, uh, and they've done, it, it's sort of similar ballpark with uh, C Sharp. It's kind of a big, uh, lots of boilerplate, um, very enterprisey feel, but you can of course do web applications in those languages. Although personally, I would not do that. Uh, it, I've done it and it's kind of heavy and you end up writing, typing a lot of boilerplate. There are generators, but it, it feels, Old fashioned, to be honest. Golang, yes. So you are doing a lot of web programming in Golang. Golang has excellent support for networking and uh, web programming built in. You don't need any dependencies and it is relatively straightforward. So I, when I learned Golang, I dropped um, Node and I dropped JavaScript. I went full into Golang because of the type safety and the testing framework and the errors that I can catch and uh, kind of help uh, to fine tune the applications to be error prone. Um, also in Node <clears throat> and JavaScript, if you write something today and it works and you shelve it and you come back to it after half a year and you try to run it, yes, it will run, but it will have a lot of uh, security warnings, a lot of uh, deprecated uh, dependencies, and all the dependencies that you have will be new because in six months, everything moves forward and you will have to update your code. And updating your code in JavaScript is really tedious because it's not just updating the dependencies, but you have to check if your code now fulfills all those new APIs and new dependencies. Some uh, upgrades are backwards compatible and some are not. And then that's where you need all those tests. If you write something in Golang today and come back to it in six months, you just recompile it. You, if you're not using any dependencies, nothing will change. If there are any breaking changes in the API, which they normally are not, the compiler will tell you and then you just fix them. And most often than not, you just recompile it and everything is fine. Uh, you are up to date. Uh, so man maintaining of Golang uh, web applications, it's so much easier than maintaining JavaScript applications, then there is no uh, benefit uh, not to go this way. All right, so that, that's a little bit ranty and, and you may disagree with me. I, I'm not saying, you know, I, I am correct with this uh, perspective. Pascal, um, I think, you underappreciate Haskell. And this lecture will be trying to tell you that programming web applications in Haskell is actually easier than in Golang and much more powerful and much more safe. So Haskell compared to Golang, I would think for the web part, I'm, I'm not talking about the kind of the business logic part. Um, and if you are familiar like with the, uh, imperative style, of course, you will feel at home more here than here. Uh, but the web part, the, the sort of the, the part that relates to web is, is really, really nice here. So let's try. Let's try to look into this, uh, why I am saying this and why we should be looking into Haskell. So Haskell is 
of course, a str strongly, strictly typed language with a very rich type system because you have uh, normal types, you have the polymorphic types, you have generics, you have polymorphic constants. Uh, you can very easily do a lot of abstractions. That's what we learned with the applicative and, uh, and monads. And it, you can easily hide a lot of plumbing. So for example, we, uh, we can easily hide the way we handle errors such that they are handled, but without any kind of decorations that we have to use in our code. Um, so those features plus uh, ability to do template and generic programming and to isolate the IO uh, on a kind of a periphery of our application and keep the, the core, the business logic pure, make Haskell a very good candidate for uh, web programming. So what is web? Uh, well, you know, it's inherently unsafe. Everything which we are sending back and forth is pretty much text. Uh, there is no guaranteed safety. Connections can break. Requests can be, you know, un unfulfilled. Um, you have a lot of uh, messiness to deal with and you do need to sanitize everything. So when you're consuming some uh, REST API, you need to sanitize that there was no changes, that the JSON is what you think it should be, that the types are th what you think they should be. Sometimes REST API give, gives you numbers as, as strings. You have to parse them, you may have parse errors. So there, it's kind of a, you know, a complex environment. You have complex flows to deal with, like you have compression, you have different data types like images, videos, text, uh, structured data like YAML or JSON. Um, so you have to build those complex relationships, complex flows. And we, you know, we use some middleware, we use some kind of um, web frameworks to help us dealing with that. You have authentication, you have authentication tokens. It, it is kind of complex. So, you know, if you think about programming, web application with sessions and authentication and compression and security and, and so on, you do need to deal with all of that. And what we would like to do is we would like to hide as much of this complexity behind some high level API such that we don't have to manually deal with all of that, right? Another feature of the web is that it's highly concurrent. Like you can do a lot of things in parallel or in, uh, you know, uh, at the same time. So even when you're loading an HTML page, the modern browsers, they know they need to fetch a lot of elements like uh, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, they have to fetch some content, maybe images. Uh, and then they can do all of that in parallel. And then at the same time, they can render the skeleton of the, of the page and then start filling up uh, the various parts. So all this programming requires kind of a support for highly concurrent programming. And yes, noticeably, Golang is, is really good with that, with uh, Go routines and with ability to do concurrency really easily in Golang, right? Uh, same with the complex flows. Uh, we have this sort of functional feel and the frameworks which we are using in Golang, they allow you to sort of inject middleware and deal with some of this complexity behind the well built API. Uh, so those two are um, kind of well supported in Golang as well, right? And then uh, with unsafe, let's, let's wait a little bit. And then the final one is that naturally you will be using multiple languages, right? So you will you have your kind of language of choice uh, for programming the backend and programming the logic, but to communicate with the browser and with the client, you will have to use HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all, all, all of that, right? So you will need to program in a kind of a multi-language environment, no matter what. Uh, all those are sort of different, uh, not, not necessarily programming languages, but they are different languages. They use different syntax, they have different semantics, and you have to deal with that. And yes, I, I have to admit that the appeal of doing uh, web programming with JavaScript and reusing the same language for the client code and for the backend code is very appealing. And that's why Node.js is, is a you know, popular uh, solution for doing and prototyping web applications. So uh, don't get me wrong, like if you want to prototype something, if you want to prototype even a complex system, I would still use Node.js and, and JavaScript or TypeScript on the front end, 
because it is a very good combination. The problem is that you need to write it, you need to test it, you have to check if it fulfills the specs, and then you have to maintain it. And then maintaining JavaScript backends or, or maintaining JavaScript or anything, yeah, it, it, it's a very complex and very tedious activity. You will be spending much, much, much more time maintaining your JavaScript code base against all the web frameworks, against all the updates and against all the dependency changes compared to the time you spend actually building it. So if you need to build something to, for a demo uh, as a prototype, then it's perfect. It's very rapid. You can do a very rapid development, <clears throat> but then you have to be prepared to, to throw it away and redo it <laughs> in a proper programming language, right? Again, I'm kind of ranting here. So don't, don't get me wrong, um, you know, it's partly joking, right? All right, um, so how this web features look with the, uh, with the Haskell. So because Haskell has this isolated IO, you can keep all this unsafe, unsafeness of the web world outside and then be really safe inside. So, and it, anything you build will have this sort of layer of checks, this layer of uh, validation and conversions, which check what comes into your application. And then everything that happens inside your application will be really type safe and safe because Haskell will enforce it. And there will be no um, mixing, right? In the normal, like in Golang, you can do that, of course. You can, do, you can try to do that as well. The problem with Golang is that Golang allows you to mix I.O. with the business logic, and then you end up with sort of unsafe everywhere because you cannot kind of be disciplined enough to keep this unsafe outside. You will always have some leakage of the unsafe data, uh, unsafe strings, some un unsavored, unchecked data into your business logic core. Whereas with Haskell, Haskell will be like a police officer, which will always prevent you to do that because they will always be keeping the IO to IO and everything else kind of safe. <clears throat> so this is sort of enforced in Haskell. Uh, it, of course, it has great abstractions for keeping the uh, safety checks and all the uh, validations. Uh, and it also allows you to do strongly type um, um, like in, in, in Golang, it's similar. Uh, so everything you do in Golang is kind of strictly typed, but we do use strings for a lot of things. And when you use strings and you change it in one place, then maybe your routes will not work anymore, or maybe something will be broken in the kind of a routing of the, of the calls. Um, in Haskell, we almost never do things by strings, which means we do things by strongly typed data structures. And then if you change something somewhere, you will have kind of a compilers. So instead of having, like if you're changing your code, if you're maintaining your code, instead of um, um, changes that break in runtime, you will have changes will the compiler will pick up and um, fix, like force you to fix. Uh, then you have um, laziness in, in Haskell, which is also a great feature because it allows you to do concurrent uh, optimizations and do certain things concurrently. So, you know, in theory, every time you use map or every time you're doing some folds or certain things on, on lists, Haskell can parallelize it. Has, Haskell can do things, in, you know, concurrently because it knows there are no side effects that will mess up um, the logic. And the, the biggest one, the biggest appeal of Haskell is that Haskell has one of the strongest support for generic and template programming. And what it means is that it's very easy to design a domain specific language, which you can use inside Haskell. So inside Haskell, you can have code which will mix HTML with Haskell logic or CSS with Haskell logic. And it's perfectly natural to have systems like that because Haskell allows you to define all this uh, parsing and kind of a complexity of dealing with programming languages, which is built in into Haskell. Uh, so it's very easy to do a multi-language kind of uh, solutions. And that's what you see when you're using some of those libraries. They, they have 
sort of it is Haskell, but they defined a lot of um, combinators and a lot of uh, syntactic sugar, such as to um, make it much easier for writing code. Uh, you, you've seen it already with the spec, uh, with the uh, unit testing. It has certain combinators which allow you to compose kind of logic in a way that it is Haskell, but it's sort of like with additional combinators and additional things. So here is the same. It allows very easy mixing of uh, various programming languages or various approaches uh, in a single programming environment. So those are all kind of a uh, big strengths. So what I want you to do now is we're gonna go into this link. So the link is api.chacknorris.io. Um, it's a kind of a fun, uh, fun, can, can you, by the way, can you click on those links which are in the Mentimeter? I hope you can, right? Yes, perfect, fantastic. So if you go to that link, you, you can click on it yourself. And what will happen is it's sort of like a web service which uh, generates a random jokes. Um, so it returns, what is it? What does it return? It's JSON. So it returns a JSON uh, with a couple of uh, properties like categories, uh, science, uh, created at a string, which is a, a date, a, an icon URL, some ID, updated at a URL for that particular joke, and then value. And the value is the actual joke, right? So it says, uh, my, my one says, when Chuck Norris falls in water, Chuck Norris doesn't get wet. <laughs> water gets Chuck Norris. Yeah, all right. So what we want, we want to use this API. We want to use this sort of um, uh, simple service to learn about HTTP, about requests, about getting the, the joke and parsing the JSON, and then um, obtaining this value. So obtaining the value out, out of this struct, right? So what we will code is we will, I have it here. So if I say stack run, it will fetch the joke for us, parse the, uh, parse the uh, JSON, extract the joke. And I have a version which also extract a status code and prints me what was the status code of the response that I got and then prints it onto standard output, right? So hard, how hard that, that could be in Haskell to do, uh, you probably know how hard that would be in, in Golang. Uh, so we will kind of do a little bit of a comparison how, how hard that, that will work, right? So we will learn a little bit about HTTP, get request and, and JSON parsing. All right, so let's, it's easy. I think it's, it's relatively easy. So let us start with main. Uh, we need to, so I'm doing it with you, uh, but I'm hoping you're doing it on your computers as well, right? So you've generated the, this package. And then if you open up main, you will have your main uh, and the main is empty, right? So the main is empty and we will, uh, we will need to, um, we will need to have a get, get joke method and the get joke method will do something for us because we want to use it in our main, right? What we need, we need to get a joke and print it onto the screen, right? So all the business logic will be kind of in the get joke. In here, we will call get joke to get the joke and print it to the screen, right? So the first task is to write get joke. And the first task is to write that method signature. So what is the method signature of our get joke method? What, what would you suggest we, we, we do? So suggestions, please. You can be wrong. Just what do you think? What, what do you think should be the signature of the get joke? Uh, I remind you that we will be calling it here, right? 
So we will calling get joke. We need to get the joke, and then we want to print it onto the screen, right? Perfect. So Frederick is saying, well, it needs to return um, return a string. So we're not, not doing the error code yet, the status code. We're only doing the joke, right? So uh, Frederick's idea is it should return a string, right? So maybe, maybe something like this, OK? Uh, no, a, yes, we. <laughs> Okay, get joke may take something and return a, but we need to be a little bit more precise, like what we want it to do, right? What do we want to pass to it, if anything, and what we want to get out. <clears throat> I, I don't think we should pass anything to it uh, because um, I don't want to make main too complex. As I said, the main should do two things. Uh, main should do two things for us. One, get a joke and then print it to the screen. <clears throat> Right? So, well, yes, having a joke as a string, I mean, you know, ultimately the joke is a string, right? It, this is just a string. So representing the joke, you see, this is a joke and it is a string, right? So representing a joke as a string, it's perfectly reasonable. <clears throat> um, so get joke string would be, would be reasonable, but, you, we have to remember about something. What do we need to remember about? How will it get joke get the joke? Well, it, it, it needs to talk to the network, right? The get joke will get a joke from the network, right? So even though get joke doesn't take any parameters, it needs to get the joke from somewhere, right? Exactly, it needs IO. That's right. So get joke needs IO, right? So I think what we need to do is we need to say get joke signature will be IO because get joke needs to be inside this IO monad to be able to do network calls, right? So because get joke will have to get the data from IO, then we cannot have this signature because then get joke would not make network calls, right? We need to live inside an IO. And then uh, get joke will give us the joke, right? So uh, those of you who thought about a signature a little bit like this, I think that's the simple one and that's the one we want to go for. Um, how could we complicate life? Well, we could complicate life because if get joke gets an error, uh, like it cannot fetch the joke or this, your network is not working or the JSON parsing failed or, or, or right, whatever, something happened. Uh, currently, we're not dealing with errors. We basically will throw an exception or we will throw an error to the user and crash the program because in here, we're not dealing with errors. We're just saying get joke will do the IO and give us a joke. If something goes wrong, this function cannot tell us that something went wrong, right? Because it only works when things work well. So we have to like, uh, we are not dealing with errors ourselves. We're letting the frameworks and the system to deal with errors. And then they will effectively be like a runtime exception, which will crash the program, which is okay. We don't want to deal with errors at the moment. All right, so we have that sorted. So we have get joke. We haven't implemented it yet, but that's okay. Uh, the second thing is we need to write our main. So having imagine that you've already implemented it and it is IO string and it gives you the, you know, the joke. How will you print the joke? A simple task. <laughs> so let's do that. Um, write a code now, which will call get joke and print us the joke. You can use do or try to do without do. So how can we write that part? Perfect. So let me, yeah, keep, keep, please keep typing. Uh, please keep coming with ideas. I will write them here. So one idea. Okay, I, I do need a bigger screen. 
but let's see we can fit okay so do and then we will get the joke from the get joke method and then we will put string line joke perfect that's our implementation of our main and it's a, a perfectly working code um any other ideas can you can you do this with the without do anyone who can who can do it without do did i pause the sorry did i pause the screen no, i don't think so no it's it's fine okay so uh This is fine. This code works. This code is good. Um, and in fact, I will comment on it. Uh, good code with do. So how can you do this? How can you do the same without do? Should you do it without do? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think you should do it with do. Uh, but just to get kind of familiar, um, with some of the monadic operators and some of the combinators. It's sometimes for such simple cases, uh, try to think in kind of a more functional way of, of what happens, right? So what happens here? Um, we have get joke. Get joke is uh, a function which doesn't take any parameters and it returns uh, a string inside the IO monad, right? So get joke returns us a value um, inside um, a box, inside the IO monad, right? So <clears throat> let me show you here. So see. Oh, I'm already in here. Perfect. So um, unfortunately, my code does not compile. So I have to go to the plain JCI. But anyway, so I have a function which uh, returns an IO string, right? So let's, uh, let, let me do like a get joke mock, which will be return um, hello, and it is an IO string, right? So if I ask, okay, what's a get joke? It says, well, it's a function which returns IO string. So we, we kind of have a mock for what get joke is doing, right? So get joke is a function which takes uh, nothing and produces a value in the monadic context, right? So what I, I, I will just tell you without asking a question. So if, if you ask what is the bind operator, uh, the bind operator takes a value in the monadic context. It takes a function which operates on this, on this value and produces another value in the monadic context and gives you this monadic, new monadic value, right? So it converts this monadic value to this monadic value. So if I ask what is a put string line, it says it takes a string and gives you kind of nothing. It gives you an empty tuple inside the monadic context, right? So now you see we have uh, a monadic value, which is IO string. We have a function which takes as a value string and gives you something in the monadic context. And we, we, we will get the result, right? So if we go back here, uh, if we bind, get joke with put string line, it will be exactly the same as this code, but we sort of avoided having this assignment, avoided kind of extracting the value out by this syntactic sugar. It just happens because of the, of the bind operator, right? So the bind operator binds this A for us, binds this A for us from 
get joke, this is our A with the, and this is our A in put string line. Do you get it? So I, because I can see you, you kind of had a little bit of trouble writing it as a one liner. Um, so this is how would you write it in this particular case, because you're just getting one value and then you're putting it through this function and what you will get at the end is, you know, uh, what you will get at the end is IO empty, right? You will get this because that's what put string line returns, right? So put string line returns IO empty. And this is exactly what we need to return from, sorry, what we need to return from main, right? So the end of this function, which is the end of this do sequence is an IO empty and empty tuple. So put, you know, printing the value will return us this, which is the end of this call with this value, which is also this. So th those two codes are an equivalent. They are exactly the same. It's just that this one is using the bind operator for monadic contexts. Whereas this one is hiding how we use this bind operator uh, by doing this do expression, right? So we are getting a joke and then uh, we just printing it. Does it make sense now? Do you know where this comes from? I hope, I hope it does. So I, I will kind of leave it here. Um, we, which code is better? Well, you know, uh, this code is better. Like this one is a little bit more readable, but this code should be as readable for you as this one, because Get joke just gives you back something in the IO monad and then put string line and it has to be a string because this guy accepts string, right? This thing expects to get a string. And because joke here, it's not a string inside the IO monad. Joke here is just a, a normal string. Uh, get joke returns IO string, but this joke is a normal string because this operator, ex, uh, this operator here, I Come on, you know, the, 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 the left arrow e extracts the value out of this monadic context. So that's what this do together with this arrow do for us. They extract the value out and then put string takes a string. Joke is a normal string. So, but put string can operate on, on the monadic value if you use the bind operator. So the bind operator allows put string to take this as an argument. It just happens that in, in, in Haskell, you have the sort of, you're not saying map this on this value, you say bind this value to this function, right? So with fmap, um, where is my, where is my cursor? Uh, my cursor is here. So with, um, with fmap, we have function mapped um, map over value, right? But with bind, so this is like function mapped over value. With bind, we have value bind to a function. So the order is get joke bind with a put string line, right? All right, I hope this, this is a little bit desugared and this is a little bit more understandable. Uh, we more, more often than not, we are extracting things multiple times and maybe we want to reuse it. Maybe we want to do something with the joke. Uh, so then this notation will quickly become tedious and we don't want to use it for more complex things. But for this simple particular thing, this is kind of nice because you say, bind this value to this function. That's all we're doing here. And I don't care about this value. I don't need this additional variable to tell me that I got the value, which is the joke, right? Um, so I'm kind of avoiding having this extra context uh, if I do this. But as I'm saying, this is perfectly legal Haskell and this is the preferred way of doing these operations on the inside the IO monad. All right, so we have this covered. Uh, before I save it, I will delete this because we want to move it into the, our library, right? So what will happen is we will import this get joke function from here 
and then we will call it here, right? So I will leave it. Um, I will leave it like this, and we will vim source lib. Um, I hope I didn't write too much in here. No, I didn't. Perfect. So we exporting get joke and our get joke. Um, we now need to implement our get joke, and our get joke is io string. Perfect. So now we need to have uh, we need to do things. Uh, first, we have to define our constant constant URL for the uh, HTTP get request, right? Then we need to do the get request to get the JSON. And then we need to do three, what we need to do, we need to parse the JSON into a data structure that we can extract, extract value field out of the structure. And then five thing return, return the string, right? That's our pseudocode. That's what we need to do. So what we will do is we will keep it here. And we will first say we'll have a chuck chuck API, which will be our request. And then we have to define chuck API to be something. Okay. So then um, we move on. So we are moving on and we need this request, right? We need this HTTP request. Like in Golang, you also need a HTTP request. Here you also need it. So we will say request. And here we see that request is defined in the conduit, uh, conduit API. So a network HTTP client, that's our um, request uh, conduit. Uh, is the one which we um, which we are using, but let me um, yeah, let me import it. So let me do this. We, you you can do it different ways. Uh, the first scary way is just to look at this, right? Uh, so what is request? Request is a giant function jesus like uh one two three four five uh, it has like you know 15 parameters and the request uh, at the end of all those parameters returns a request right so a request is a kind of a giant method which and it's a, kind of a little bit confusing right so if you click on it um what is this bool so what okay let me do this so i will Duplicate this. So if you say, what's method? What's bool? Like it takes a bool, right? The request takes a bool and byte string and an int. What are those, right? Well, you know, if you kind of look at the type, uh, if you click on it and look at the type, you will see that uh, there is no real magic. Request is sort of like a record type. And the first parameter is a method, which is a method. And then the second one, whether we using HTTPS or not. So this bool. Uh, this bool basically is a parameter which tells if we're using HTTPS or not. And then you have host, and then this int, which is here, is the port, right? So, okay, there it's not as scary anymore. So this is kind of a big struct, which has all those parameters, and they are kind of described here with human readable methods. Uh, and then at the end, it will construct this kind of a struct uh, for you, and it will be your request, right? And what we need is we need to import. Um, so we need to import. Um, what was it? Uh, network HTTP client. And then if you're using kind of a more fancy ID, you can basically say, I want to import just request out of this, or you can just leave it like that. And then uh, what will happen is 
we want to use this URL, right? So I will copy that. Okay, so we want to do this. And we will say, um, just for testing purposes, let's say return hello Chuck, okay? So what it will do, it will return the string inside an IO context such that we can compile and test uh, and test our and test what we have so far, right? So if I say stack build, we will test if it compiles. Uh, I didn't. Um, I don't see this. So line number 11, and I need them source lip. Line number 11, yes, I have this missing comment symbol. So one more time. So you build it yourself as well. By now you should have the, um, yeah, so as you see the conduit, uh, because I, I should use the conduit and um, the, um, there is a, a small, small mistake because what we need to actually import is HTTP, um simple let's build it again okay so now it compiles but it has one error one error is you know um we have a request as a type of our Chuck API, but we give it a string, okay? So <laughs> that is, um, that is, where are we here? So we need, um, so we basically did that. Uh, we've already passed that, that point and we, um, you see the Chug API type is request, where uh, what is this? Well, this is a string and that's what the compiler tells us. Look, you, you're passing a string and pretending it to be a request. Okay, so let me, let me do, um, clear, let me do this trick. Okay, so now I will say uh, language um, overloaded strings. Okay, and we save it. Um, and we build it. and it will magically compile, right? Um, so there is a little bit of magic which happens uh, because now Pascal is happy with me giving it that string and that string not being a string type, it is a request type, right? So as you know, same as with numbers, um, you know, what, what is this 23? Well, we don't know, it's a polymorphic literal. It could be of type int, it could be of type integral, uh, it could be a float, uh, it could be anything. It's, you know, we, all we know at the moment is just, it's a number, right? Uh, but number is like a type class uh, and integral is a type class. Uh, that this is like a concrete type uh, and this is a concrete type, but we don't know what 23 is. So it's the same with strings, with string literals. Right, so if I have a string literal like hello, um, that typically is a string, which is the same as um, 
as this as car, but with this extra with this extra overloaded strings um, directive, uh, we have the ability to do kind of fancy fancy things with the string literals. And if you go in there, you will learn that uh, it's a little bit complicated, but not too much. What what it is is that if you have a instance of a string uh, and that the all, all you need to do is you, you need to define a from string method uh, on that uh, type class which takes a string and gives you whatever that that is whatever type you are um, so for example if you define the student uh, class uh, student record and make it an instance of a is string type class and you implement this method, then what you will be able to do, you will be able to say that, for example, um, I have um, student, which will be of type student, and I can use the string, uh, maybe John Smith, um, and like we've been using H, right? So let's use 23. And if this string knows how to parse this and create an instance of a student, then you can actually use this as a, as a student. So the string literal will become a student instance, right? Uh, it's very powerful, like because you can define your own um, your own conversions from string to the type that you need. And in the context of this, um, what happens here is we uh have a string which gets converted automatically into a request right so this chuck api is a constant for us because it's just it doesn't do anything it just returns that string in fact it's not a string it's a request right um so we have this um sorted and if i uh, if i say stack run it will basically print hello Oh, hello, Chuck, because it works, right? We, we have all the plumbing already done and the plumbing related to the uh, conversion of this, uh, of this request is kind of done by this line. So now, instead of returning a dummy string, we need to make, a, we need to make, we need to make this. We need to do a do, do, do the get request, which we need to execute that request, get the response, get the content of this response, and then parse the, the JSON and get, get the string, right? Okay, so let's have a break. Um, break, yes, Suzanne, ah, good thinking. So let's have a break. Um, we will have what we usually have, 10 minutes. So timer, 10 minutes. And we will come back to this. I will pause the recording. <clears throat> all right. All right, all right. So, we were on to the coercion of the strings into various things that yeah that's advanced you don't normally you don't need to use those uh yourself but you need to include this um overloaded strings directive so that's the important part there was one more thing i wanted to to check so um you see there is um the, uh, the request is inside network HTTP client um, and some internal representation of it. It is also inside the network HTTP simple. And we are using the conduit um, uh, API, which is a higher level API. And it allows us to do, for example, parsing of the, um, so if, if, yeah, you can basically check it out yourself. Uh, so if we open those two, so we have the HTTP simple, uh, and then you, as you see, you have to kind of uh, do this uh, 
And then you have kind of like a higher level uh, requests like uh, HTTP DS, uh, which kind of uh, gives you the byte string. Uh, you can use lazy byte strings. You can do HTTP JSON, right? And that's the one which we would like to use to um, get the response. Uh, if you check on the uh, HTTP client, uh, then you have a lower level API and you have to do certain management of the, um, yeah, so instead of me talking, you can kind of check here. So um, the HTTP below is rather low level. The, the network HTTP simple module from the conduit provides high level APIs and it provides support like parsing JSON and so on. So it hides certain um, complexity from you, but if you really want to go really low level, then you will use the HTTP client. So unlike Golang, which only has one HTTP library and you do everything there, which is kind of a, like an, in the middle. It's not that low level, but it's not really that high level. You have to do certain plumbing yourself. Uh, Haskell has sort of a tool. Uh, client is for really low level API. And then, um, and then uh, HTTP simple is the one which we off, use most, most of the time. Uh, and that, that one is, it has kind of a methods like this one. And as you see, it takes, HTTP JSON takes a request and gets, gets us a, a response, right? Um, so here, here it goes. It's like already part of our, of our solution, but let's, let's move on here. What do we need to do? So we need to do JSON and JSON in Haskell is pretty much done the same way as uh, JSON in, uh, in Golang or in other programming languages, you basically need to marshal and unmarshal it into some sort of a struct or some sort of a uh, type that uh, the parsing library knows how to go back and forth, right? Um, so we need a record type, right? We need kind of a record type to represent our joke. Um, so now I think I have as it as a kind of a task for you. Yeah, defined a struct aka record type for a joke. So you can now go and do it. Uh, don't, don't do it here, do it in your editor for your code. And I will, I, I will do it here. So we need a data type, which is a joke and it will be, it will have a single constructor uh, and it will have a couple of fields. Um, and the first field is, if I go to this chuck. So as you see, the first field is categories and it is basically a list of strings. At least it seems like a list of strings. So what I will do is I will say uh, catego, catego, categories and it is um, a list of strings, right? So that will be my first. Uh, then I have created at, okay, copy and paste. So created at, let's make it nicer. And what type is that? Well, it's a string. We could uh, coerce this into some sort of a date, but because we're not using it, we don't care. Uh, the next one is icon URL. So, I will say icon URL, it's also a string. Um, and then there is an ID. Okay, updated it. Let's do updated that first. So I will do it here. Icon URL, what was, what was that ID? What else? Um, the URL and the most important one is the value. Um, value, which is a string also. Okay. 
So, so that's the one which we want. And that's the one which will give us the, the final string. I don't know why this one, the coloring is broken. Okay, so we have our, our struct. Um, usually when you define your own structs, uh, it's a good idea to say deriving and to derive an equality check such um, it will kind of derive the equality comparison of your instances uh, of, your, of your type and also kind of do a show. Um, you can define them yourself, but if you want to, to show an instance, like if we want to print the entire joke uh, struct, then by deriving it, it will kind of generate the show method for our record, and then we will be able to show it, like uh, to convert it to a string. Um, you can override it yourself. So if you don't do that, you can uh, override uh, your instances yourself by saying instance show joke and then where and then define like what the, the show method does and define it yourself. But to avoid typing it, you can use the, you know, as we were discussing the properties of uh, Haskell generating code for you and basically saying, okay, I am happy with the default implementation of show and you have it like this, right? So that would be the, that would be the struct that we need for the joke. Okay, what else do we need? We will do HTTP JSON request, right? So that's fair enough. Uh, we've already learned about it. Uh, where was it? It was here. Uh, and it just takes a request and returns the response. So, well, that looks simple enough. So if we say HTTP JSON uh, and we call it with our Chuck API, we will get what we will get. We will get a monadic context of <clears throat> some sort of a IO and the response is inside a box. It, it's inside the response box. So we have the monadic context and we also have the response object, which is another box inside this box, which has the actual content of what is there, right? Um, so if we go to the response now and we check uh, what response has, um, well, you will kind of have a number of constructs which are kind of a, um, um, used in here. And then you have a number of utility functions which will, um, which will give you something on, on the um, response. Yeah, so th this is for the request, uh, request body. Yeah, so we are kind of in the wrong place actually because let's go back here. This one, yeah, no, we are in the correct place, but it has, so the page is really long because we are in the wrong place on the page. So we need to find response. Yare, yare, yare. Okay, anyway, we kind of, uh, by, by chance, we found get response body, right? So it says, um, um, yeah, let's not properly find it. So if I say get response body, uh, yes, that's the one. So as you see, get response body takes a response as a far first parameter and the responses of something, and then it gives me this something back. So it sort of extracts the, the inner thing for me out, right? and it takes the response, right? So in our case, I have, I have this, 
Um, okay, let, let, let's do first the do notation because then it's a little bit easier to follow. So I have the response, uh, which this call generates, right? Um, so if I say, <clears throat> This style of coding is kind of ugly, but um, it, it's very verbose and it's a little easier to follow. So first we got the response out of this call and now we get a body, which is, um, what was it? Get uh, response body out of the response, right? And then we will have the body and the body will be our, uh, our JSON and it has a, a, like our, our joke type and it has a method value, right? So then I will have let a joke be value out of my body, right? And then at the end of this, I will return joke because joke is a string and we need to have an IO string, right? So we need to wrap it into the IO. Um, so that's the logic that we have to do. This is a very ugly code, um, but it kind of step by step represents what we're doing. Um, this is our struct. And there is one more thing that we need to do for all the plumbing, plumbing to work. So if, you, if I save it, um, and if I try to compile it, if I try to run it now, it will complain and some of you may say, oh, you know, this is, um, uh, yeah. So one thing that we messed up is that that's good. Um, we have uh, in line um, 33, uh, we have, uh, we are expecting kind of a, a joke record, but we have the response A. So we, we did uh, a, a normal assignment in a place where we're supposed to be using this kind of extract value out of something kind of assignment. So let's um, let's have a look. What was it? Thirty-three. Yeah, here. So um, get this. Response body, let's see. Get response body takes a response A and gives you an A. Yeah, that sounds fine. Um, let's see. We need to get it out of the Do you like it now? No, you still don't like it. Okay, let's fight the type system. So what it says? Yeah, of course not, because so this is wrong because we are inside the IO monadic do. So that deals with the IO uh, conversions, right? So it has to be, it has to be that. Um, let's align it the way it wants. Um, let's save it and one more time. So we, um, <laughs> Some suggestions. Yes, we could do the bind. So we will do, Susanna is suggesting we should bind what we need to do over, uh, but I, I want to do it after. So I want to do it this, in this kind of imperative style first. We are missing, 
because value takes a joke. And what is the body? Um, yeah, let me. So sometimes um, it's actually good to use a, a proper IDE because then you get a little bit more help from the editor. Uh, there it's, it's probably something trivial, but finding out those trivial things sometimes is not that easy. So let us switch to IntelliJ. And I will, I will open it there so I can in, like check what I'm getting. Okay, so let's do, I, I do work with uh, IntelliJ uh, and the Haskell uh, plugin for some of the uh, larger projects. And I, I will show you this, um, this one once we finish the, the joke. So on the laptop and together with Zoom, it, it will be slow though. So it, it will be a little bit annoyingly slow. But Okay, so we open projects, programming jokes. Yep. There are some errors. Okay, so my ID crashed. Oh, come on. Okay, so we are inside source. Unfortunately, it will need to index all the symbols before it's useful. Okay. That's right. So all I wanted is to check what is the type of this um, because if this is wrapped inside uh, some monadic context, uh, I mean this, then we cannot call value on it because value expects um, a plain joke. So. Uh, body cannot be in the box because then value cannot kind of be applied to it. Um, so I, I need to know, yeah, but that is not working yet. And the error message suggests that um, that it's a response. which is weird because the uh, we got the response as this. So this is a response. Yeah, it will take a while. Um, anyway, we, we will come back to that in a moment. So let's do, while it's doing it, let's sort of um, do what Suzanne was suggesting. Let's... Um, Comment it out. And let's do what we need to do. So what we need to do is we need to um, HTTP um, JSON on Chuck API, which is bound to a function which um, takes the response. So we need um, we need to do value combined with get response body on the response which is returned from the um, from that 
right? So that that would be the uh, operation that we need to um, to get, and value returns as a string, and then we have to return uh, the I/O context out of this operation on top of the response that we're getting from that. So we can do this. Let's uh, let's save that and let's see. Uh, yeah, let's run it. <clears throat> there is, uh, as you notice, there is a, a certain amount of. Um, thinking involved in programming in Haskell. You have to uh, always kind of get the, the types matching. Uh, and that is um, sometimes um, yeah, non-trivial. Non so here, what it uh, complains about, um, right, that's right. So now, now it, it, it is fine. We get where I want it to be. <laughs> so I want it to be for the HTTP JSON call uh, because um, we getting something from the... Um, so uh, yeah, let's, let's do it here. So what happens is um, we have... We, we have kind of a plumbed everything together, but uh, we defined a new type, okay? We defined a new type and now the parsing library needs to, because you see we're using it here. Um, so because we're using it here, Haskell knows that the request body should be of that type, but the JSON parsing library doesn't know how to do the parsing. We haven't plumbed together the, the new type that we just defined with the JSON parsing library to know about that this is a new type and it needs to be parsed certain way, right? Um, so remember you, you have to kind of uh, do uh, this type coercion uh, in, in Golang as well. You have to tell the marshalling engine like what is the type it should use to parse your JSON into and it will use reflection to sort of uh, wire up the types. And it, it is doing it somewhat dynamically. Uh, in Haskell, we, we do it, we, we need to do it statically. And it has a little bit of magic to, to do it. So one uh, additional extension that we need to do is we need to define, um, we need to define another language extension, uh, which is called, um, uh, which is called, derive generic and derive generic is a very um, very interesting let me see um, let me see let me see here no that's not that browser it's this browser I, uh, I am here. So yeah, get the response body, we covered that. Now we executing the request uh, and get the value out of the response body. Yes, we're doing that. Um, so this is the, the code that we sort of ended up with, with the bind operator, as Suzanne suggested. It turned out to be easier to do it this way than imperative style. Wow, you know, that's amazing. All right, so then we need this JSON plumbing. So to do this JSON plumbing, we need to tell um, the we need to tell the uh, inference engine that joke has is an instance of the from and to JSON, right? In our case, we don't need both. We only need um, we only need joke to be an instance of instance from JSON. Right, because we're parsing from JSON to joke, right? So we kind of need to do this. And to, to, to define this, you would need to define this parsing kind of a wiring up that 
sometimes you need to do in Golang uh, to tell how JSON is converted into the joke. But because we don't want to write this code, then this is why we need uh, we need this directive. So derive derive generic. Uh, derive generic is um, I have a link here. Yeah. So it's a very um, uh, neat concept which allows generic programming. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it here. Uh, the, it, it's a very powerful mechanism to, to define functions on types that are very similar. So imagine that you have either and a result. You, let's say you defined two types yourself and either is A and B, they are both generic types, right? Uh, we, we don't uh, instantiate them yet. They are generic types and either is A and B and it has a left side and the right side. And on the left, it has A and on the right, it has B. But you see a result has an error A uh, on the left and OK on the B. So, you know, sy syntactically, they are identical. They are kind of isomorphic, like the either type is exactly the same as result type, even, even though those are two separate types. They are two different types and they are not compatible with each other. So I cannot assign result to either and either to result. But if I'm writing now a function which is doing something, let's say I want to define uh, from left, OK? So if I define from left for either type, the logic of my from left will be exactly the same as the logic for getting an error from the result because you know a a a a left left and so on so they are they have the same shape but they are different types and this generic the derived generic what it does it generates automatically kind of a generic abstract representation of this type in a kind of a specific language and then it generates the same abstract specific uh, description of this type and then because the descriptions will be the same I can write a from left function generically now, which can be instantiated either for either type or for result, and it will work in either case, right? So generics allow programming functions that operate on isomorphic types without the code being written twice. So now if I need to write from left function for either, I can write it once and it will work for either and for result because of this generic properties and because I'm kind of deriving this generic. Um, description. So then we need to derive generic and we need to make the instance which basically wires up my joke with the parsing library and makes it uh, it makes it um, parsable. So if I quit and if I say run, This will work, well, I hope. Uh, almost. So I have not um, declared where it comes from. So I will go to Google and I will ask from Jason where it is coming from and it's coming from data ASM. Uh, so what we need is we need to say uh, import. Okay, let's, let's uh, not do that this here. Let's see if my fancy, fancy thing, uh, yeah. So now with the fancy IDE, uh, it sort of recognizes that I haven't imported that and it gives you kind of hints. Okay, I can do this import, um, you know, uh, with the click of a mouse. So that I've done, the I've generic I've done. All right, so let's try to build it. Yes, so it took us a little bit longer. Oh, please. Um, uh, what do you want from me? Uh, 
There is no, oh yeah, okay, I know. So the error is here. Uh, error says, there is no instance for generic joke. So even though the plumbing has been done and even though the generic representation of that can be generated, I didn't say uh, that it should be generated. So I need to say here, derive generic. And then because generic, I haven't imported it, I have to import it. So now we are importing generic from this and from JSON from there. And now if we build it and I read your comments, no import should work. It was the derive which was missing. So I hope, let's see. You're never sure until the Haskell compiler says, okay, it lo looks good. Look at this, it looks good. And we have a joke. Uh, all right, so we have it working. We have all the plumbing done. We have the import sorted. Um, we have the get joke exported to our main uh, function. And then this works and this works. The only thing that we still haven't really did is to fix the imperative code, right? So let's leave it uh, as, a, as a homework. Um, I will commit the code into the repository, the, the, the uh, Chuck Norris jokes. Um, as you see the code, like the, 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 the bulkiest part is the, the declaration of this, um, of this struct. Uh, all the plumbing and all the rest is pretty much one liners, right? So we can get this, this interaction with the rest API with the service in a very simple high level way. Um, so what I will commit, I will commit because I am doing the imperative style to get the response code because we need to get the re, um, response and from the response, I need to get the body, but I also need to get um, I need to get the uh, status code, right? Um, and it's get response status, uh, and I need to pass the response twice, right? So doing it, like doing the status code and body in this kind of a one-liner would be really ugly. Uh, so it's better to do it in the do expression. Um, so I will commit the code into the repo and you will have a look. Uh, and then you will notice there is a, uh, there is a partially um, finished project. Um, so if you go programming, no, this one. If you go to the repository, you will see that there is a, a student web, which is a skeleton for the this one. It's a skeleton for a web system. Uh, which is using the server side to now expose some API, uh, REST API into the, into the world. And this one is using uh, Yesot. And Yesot is a little bit more complex, um, you know, web framework uh, that I have posted some, um, some helps here uh, for you to get into if you want to program some REST API in Haskell instead of Golang. Uh, I talked with uh, Christopher, and if you want to do something in, in Haskell instead of Golang, you can. Um, so for some of your services and some of, of the projects, you can use um, Haskell instead of Golang uh, and have it sort of done with Yesot if, if you want. Um, all right. Um, Yeah, so uh, Miguel asked uh, about the, the question about how I uh, fix the response with, uh, with string. Uh, so you overload overloaded strings. You need to use the um, uh, compiler directive to instruct the compiler to in enable overloaded strings, which will allow string literal to be coerced to a different type. 
other than string. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so, so check this. This is noticeably more complex to what we've been doing, but it, it basically you have all the concepts already in. So all it takes is a little bit of a practice. And what I am doing is I am doing this uh, student's uh, project such that you can, um, uh, you can do the, uh, the pro, the, um, some of the wiring uh, for, yeah. So the code for get joke is we using this monadic notation. So we doing HTTP JSON request check API. So we getting the response monadic uh, IO response here. And then we doing get response body on this dot value, which is to get the string and then dot return to wrap the string into the IO, IO monad, right? So it's return dot value dot get response body. That's what get joke does. Um, All right, so one, one small thing left. Um, what you will notice is, oh yeah, let me open the, so I'll close this and I'll open my student web. So this one is not done yet. It, it's like uh, it compiles and it runs tests, but it's not working. Like it doesn't do the, the rest up yet. Um, so what you will notice is that you writing like uh, uh, you know uh, nice comments uh, and then uh, it's initializing Jesus All right so if you go to the wiki and if you go to about Haskell you will notice that there is um, a little bit extra blob uh, on documentation so if you go to your project and you do those uh, those things, if you at least do those two, um, you will get the Hadoop uh, to generate your database for your um, for the help. And then what you can do is you can display display this kind of a Google like. You can basically have this kind of a Google like uh, browser for browsing your APIs yourself uh, on your local computer. And also the IDE, if you're using this IDE, uh, it will kind of, uh, you see, if, if I go, so let, let's go to the project. I, I've done it before the class. I've generated my, um, my uh, comments. So if, for example, if I go, uh, this one is not, if I go to, uh, if, if you highlight a particular method, then you will kind of notice that uh, the documentation, like for example, student from list, uh, it, it sort of generates the documentation for you here. And you can see all the extra help that the Hadoop kind of generated, which is taken from your kind of comments. Right, so the comments get converted into something that uh, you can either browse using your web browser or you can use the ID to kind of display stuff for you. And this is useful. Uh, this is useful because uh, it kind of gives you some context. Like, of course, in this case, it, it's useless because I see the comments here. But if I, I was in a place, like if I was in main and I was using this function, then I can hover over it and I can see the comments uh, directly there and I can see the type, like the type usually you can see anyway, uh, this, but you cannot see the, the comments. So this, uh, you may find doing this uh, somewhat helpful for larger projects to deal with the documentation and the comments that you're doing. So it's a, a little bit of a useful uh, hint. And with the YESOT, um, if you want to do programming like in Haskell, you will have to kind of read the book uh, but for simple things, I, I will kind of demonstrate it using the student web, and then you can use it as a as a sort of a template for doing some some of some of it yourself. Okay, so that's it for today. Again, as usual, we went uh, over time. Apologies for this.